Welcome everyone to High Tea with Red Pandas and really nice to be able to do this presentation in our um, brand spanking new public library and uh, big kudos to the community for uh, making this happen. Um, our late mayor John Ingen obviously was heavily involved with that. Uh, but yeah, great space to be able to present to you. Uh, I want to introduce real quickly uh, my wife Heather, um, who was obviously on the journey, and then our son Uriah, who was also with us, uh, mostly shooting pictures and video um, for us, which took a lot of pressure <laughs> off of yours truly and uh, Heather. But uh, he just got back from Pittsburgh, um, so Holly just graduated from Pitt and got her physical therapy doctorate, so congratulations to Holly. Uh, but yeah, they just arrived, so I'm really happy they could be here. And uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, John Zelazny, who was uh, gracious enough to do the poster artwork for us and uh, did a great job. Um, we do have some extra posters, so feel free to grab one of those if you or maybe one of your uh, kids want one. I think they look really nice. They definitely jump off the page. Um, so what I want to start with is quickly, this is the Nepali flag, and it is the only flag in the world that is non-rectangular. So a little interesting, uh, interesting twist. Uh, obviously, you can see the moon, uh, the crescent moon, and then the sun, uh, and the sun is a very powerful symbol in Nepal. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then, of course, this is the infamous Gurkha knife. And if you're at all familiar with Nepal, um, the Gurkhas were Nepali-speaking soldiers um, that fought. Um, and Nepal was never conquered by China nor India. And a big reason for that was the Gurkhas. Uh, they now, of course, some of them fight for the British Army. Um, some of them fight in the Indian Army. And then, of course, the Nepali Army is made up of, of Gurkha regiments. So, uh, Red Panda Network, um, we, I guess, I want to I say that this is very much a small world kind of story. My friend and environmental cohort, Tim Cadman, uh, and his wife, Beth, who I started the Native Forest Network with in Australia in 1991, um, we did a lot of forest activism together, and we were there in 03 for Rugby World Cup, and also um, it's where Heather and I got engaged um, in Carnarvon Gorge. But um, we had fallen out of communication. You know, we were incommunicado for about 15 years, but his wife Beth was reading a Louise Erdich book that mentioned one of our teas. And she subsequently Googled it, and Lake Missoula Tea Company popped up. So that was really cool. Uh, Tim followed up and got in touch with Heather and I. And you know, again, it's the, the wonders of the internet and the World Wide Web. It's really made the world smaller. Um, but cool kind of coincidental story that got us connected with the Red Panda Network. Tim has been working with them and he, let's see, um, he was working with RPN to build a sustainable source of income in selected communities in and around Red Panda Habitat to increase conservation and forest restoration efforts. So that was his focus. He is a, uh, a consultant for RPN, uh, but he works as a senior research fellow now at the Institute for Ethics, Governance, and Law at Griffith University in New South Wales. His primary focus is on developing governance standards to generate sustainable livelihoods and sustainable products. Um, his research group recently received funding to create a Red Panda brand for businesses supporting local conservation activities. And they're hoping to use a logo, something to the effect supporting local communities in Red Panda conservation. So this is kind of the next iteration of his involvement uh, with RPN. 
And the hope is all profits generated from the brand will go back to local communities to reinvest into local tourism, uh, small business development um, that will hopefully propel more forest restoration and habitat acquisition, and also hopefully employ more forest rangers um, to train against poachers and obviously to be out there monitoring the red pandas populations. Um, the ultimate goal is to create a system of traceability so consumers can see their dollars directly contributing to outcomes in these local communities. So that's the goal. And I will say that I think that based on our travels and what we discovered, RPN is well on their way. So this is just a photo blast from the past. Um, you'll notice me looking a little bit younger here. Um, this is Tim, Mr. Cadman. Uh, it's my brother um, who was at the board meeting, and this is Pat. So I just wanted to point them out to you. But this was uh, a Native Forest Network uh, board meeting down in San Francisco in the 90s. Okay, so where um, does Lake Missoula Tea Company fit into this equation? Um, we, through Tim's um, you know, alerting us that RPN was interested in working with tea farms and with tea companies. Now, RPN had already or has already been working with local artisan producers that are making rugs, which has a cool red panda on it. Um, they're making ceramics, some mugs, and you know, some different you know, kind of dishware, um, jewelry, but again, they hadn't really branched out into an actual agricultural enterprise uh, of which tea qualifies. Um, tea is very well established in Nepal, particularly in eastern Nepal. So let me just get this map out here for you. And if you see, obviously Kathmandu is right here in the, or not right in the middle, but it's, it's central. Um, and then this is Elam. And this is Panchir. Yeah, you can hold that up. But uh, there's tea, there's tea growing in other parts of Nepal, but it's really strong in the east because of its proximity to India. A lot of the tea grown in Nepal now, it gets trucked over to Darjeeling. Um, and the Darjeeling producers are using the Nepali tea. Obviously, the environment is very same, or very similar. Um, Darjeeling's right in here somewhere. Yeah, the well, Sikkim's up higher, but Darjeeling is more down here on the edge. Okay, so with that, uh, with that being said, um, we had purchased tea through a broker here in the U.S., the Poly Tea, for a number of years. It was very expensive. So any of you that come in the tea shop and remember the Nepali Gold and the Nepali Green, um, you know, those were pretty pricey teas. So we were really excited um, when we found out that we could be developing a new source of tea in the Himalaya. And so Tim was the one that, again, made that connection for us. But we um, then reached out after, I guess this would have been last spring, we reached out to RPN directly. And RPN, um, they were really responsible for facilitating our trip. Um, they hosted us really strongly in Kathmandu um, in terms of coming up with our accommodation. Um, they also, of course, took care of all the flight logistics, and uh, they also arranged for a driver and a guide once we flew from Kathmandu over to the east side. So RPN really, really invested in us, which was awesome. Okay, so this is Sonam, and he is the... Um, whoop, let me just... Uh, Yeah, it's, it's blocked off the screen. But anyways, this is Sonam. He's the conservation program officer, and this is the executive director, um, Ang Puri Sherpa. Um, so these two gentlemen um, obviously are a big part of the Red Panda Network's uh, conservation efforts, uh, and they oversee um, quite a few other staff. Um, 
So the Red Panda Network, um, as I said, it was founded in 2005, so it's almost 20 years old. Um, it was founded by an American um, named Brian Williams. Um, and since that time, um, he's no longer a staff person, but he is still on the board. Um, but RPN has really grown a lot since then. Uh, this is a picture of their office in Kathmandu. And then this talks a little bit about their panda patrols um, and what they have, um, I guess, modeled their uh, conservation, their community-based conservation around is creating these local forest uh, user groups who are out there looking for pandas or for panda sign. Um, obviously, if they find a panda, then there's a mechanism where the Panda Network can send in some of their conservation um, officers. But it's really, really amazing to see what they have, um, what they have done. Um, so yeah, they use an integrated landscape level conservation approach built on local participation and community support. Um, and so this is a good example um, for us in terms of the tea farm. Um, so their conservation model now spans over 75 community forest uh, user groups, and this is across 13 districts in Nepal. Um, I believe since the reorganization in 2015, there are now 77 administrative districts, and there's seven provinces. So the big colors on the map are provinces, and then there's districts within those provinces. So that's their kind of governmental structure. Um, they're threatened by poaching for their fur, the pelts, and of course by forest loss and fragmentation. Um, and they live in deciduous and coniferous forests between 2,000 and 4,000 meters. So they have a fairly selected range. Um, they are omnivorous, um, so they will eat birds, small mammals, but they also eat a lot of bamboo, fruits, um, other plants. And you can see in this picture, this, this was a picture taken by Sonam, but they're slightly bigger than a house cat. Um, this was taken by yours truly in the Himalayan Zoological Park um, in Darjeeling. So after we went to Nepal, we went to India and went to the farm we work with in Darjeeling, Natsobari, and then from there, Uriah and Heather and I went up to the city of Darjeeling, and this is where the zoo is. And so the zoo, so this is in India, they have been doing a captive breeding program um, and have successfully reintroduced red pandas into the wild. Um, so we got kind of a pretty good um, sense of that through a video that they were showing at the zoo. Uh, but yeah, I took these pictures, so you know they're in enclosures, uh, but it's, pretty natural, you know, in the sense of zoos. Um, you felt like, you know, I felt bad for the tigers um, that we saw, but the pandas seemed pretty happy. Um, so here are RPN's programs, um, research and monitoring, uh, education and outreach, habitat protection, habitat restoration, anti-poaching, sustainable livelihoods. So that's again where the tea company fits in. And then I think there's one underneath there for uh, advocacy and policy, um, obviously working on more of the governmental level. Um, this is a great photo. These four um, Nepali women are tea pickers, and they're also TikTokers, <laughs> as we found out. Okay, so a couple, I just want to go through a few slides from Kathmandu because it's such an enchanting city. So. Get Nepal on your bucket list. When you go to Kathmandu, you can spend a full week there just because of all of the monuments. Um, so it's a World Heritage Site. The city is. The whole city is a World Heritage Site. And there's seven monuments, including Buddha Stupa. So this is where we stayed near. Uh, but there's three city squares that are World Heritage. And then there's uh, three other temples. I think there's a Hindu temple and a couple of other temples that you can visit um, while you're there. The most incredible thing about this is the seeing eyes. And they're on all four sides, so it's always looking at you. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Um, it's, the massive, it's a massive mandala, and it's one of the largest in the world, and it really functions as a circular square. Um, so we were just like one block, one layer behind this, where we were staying. So we were looking out into this, but there's all kinds of little shops and merchants and just really cool things to see um, when you walk around this. Obviously lots of Buddhists practicing, um, so they were all over the place. Um, and of course, many pigeons. You know, they would, and they would, at times of the day, they'd congregate up on the Mandela. Um, this is just some of the shops facing um, the stupa, and they were selling, like I said, all kinds of things. Um, out front on the table, you'll see one of the little singing bowls um, we bought, but that's one of the most famous trinkets that people will bring back uh, from Nepal. And you know, in the middle, you'll just see here, these were some of the, the boys, the Buddhist, uh, the monk boys that were just cleaning up. So they just take a shower uh, in front of us. Yeah, this is just like I said, I don't know how many angles we would look, look at this, but it never, it never got tiring. So yeah, Kathmandu, full of history, culture, and it's the center, center of Himalayan Buddhism. This is actually taken um, at the hotel that we stayed at. Um, and then this is one of uh, the Buddhist temples right across from the stupa. And so there was lots of activity going on inside of there. Uh, these are the prayer wheels, and these are used to accumulate wisdom and good karma and are part of Buddhist meditation practices. Um, the big one there was in its own room, so you kind of had to go in there and, and work your hands around it, but these are some of the smaller ones um, that, that people use. And then another big part was uh, lots of burning incense around the, um, around the circular square, um, lots of marigolds, and marigolds were everywhere in Nepal, uh, but they're very symbolic, um, and they signify the sun and positive energy. Um, so we liked marigolds, but when we got to the tea farm, there were marigolds growing everywhere too. Okay, so this is leaving Kathmandu, and of course, this is Everest. Um, couldn't see the mountains from down below, while we were there, or not very often. Um, so mostly the clouds obscured the main range of the Himalaya, but because we took several flights, we got many chances at seeing it. And so this is Everest in the background. Um, this is the Shangri-Gati airport where we flew into. So this is in the very southeastern corner of Nepal. And uh, Joppa, it's, it's, it's another district. Um, so, once we got picked up at the airport, we started our journey to the tea farm. And so this gentleman on the far right is Wang Chu. Um, grew up in Nepal, um, not very far, um, I think, from Everest. Um, from Man oh, no, it's uh, Manslu. Yeah, not very far from Manslu. Um, and subsequently got a degree in wildlife. Um, so he got his training in wildlife. And then this is our driver, Tika. And this is actually where we stayed in Elam on our first night, too. Um, yeah, this is kind of cut off, but basically it says the long and winding road to the tea farm. This is the deal. We were probably at most 60 miles from the airport to the tea farm, but it took us two days um, because of how steep the country is, and you cannot drive very fast in Nepal. Um, so in that sense, it was safe, we felt. Um, you know, they know how to use the horn, and you're always using the horn when you're going around corners. Um, but this is on the way out of Elam, and then this here, once we got within about 11 kilometers of the tea farm, we turned off the main road going up to the last district, Teplujan, and they were working on the road. Um, it was extremely wet when we came in, so we were bottoming out, probably going about four miles an hour uh, because the road was just so beat up from the heavy equipment. But obviously this is good and this is bad. Good in the sense that it's gonna make it easier for the tea farm, Pathavara, to get the tea out, 
with a better road, but it also means more people coming in, more development. So again, that's what I'm saying. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, yeah, so two-day drive. Um, the path of far at Tia State is located in Panthere. I think that's how um, Wine Chu said it, Panthere. Uh, but in any event, uh, this photo on the left is uh, a tea house in Elam that he took it to um, that first day. And uh, this gentleman is the proprietor, and he was very cool. Thanks for coming. Um, he was the, uh, the proprietor and had very good tea. Had a lot of really good tea that we got to t taste. And um, we bought a little bit of tea from him, too. Uh, but it was just nice. This is a place Wang Chu will come when he's in Elam. So he was familiar with it. And the gentleman on the right, um, we just took this photo as we were coming down, but um, you know he just had some, some leaves that he picked. Uh, you cross so many rivers because there's so much water come out of the Himalaya. Um, we think about climate change and what's gonna happen. And let me just say that the day that we arrived in Kathmandu, uh, there was a glacial outburst flood where an alluvial fan above a large glacial lake collapsed into the lake. And it dumped all this water out into the Tietze River, Tietze River being one of the main uh, drainages coming out of this part of the Himalaya. Blew a dam out. Over 120 people dead, they still haven't recovered many of those people, but it came close to blowing out dams below it. And so the Nepali government was warned that these kinds of things could happen, but we think about water and the shortage of water, particularly here in Montana. There it's not so much a shortage of water, but what can happen when a lot of water gets released all at once. And that's what happened. Yeah, so this is the Elam district. It does contain many tea farms, as I said. Um, obviously this is tea growing here on the slopes outside of town. Um, I included this photo because uh, this is a group of uh, high school students that were coming back from a cricket match that they just won, and they were banging those drums, um, and they were pretty loud. Um, but it was good to see um, the youth um, and a little bit of sport. Uh, this is the Tea and Wee Cafe. So we did, I just took this picture, so you can see the tea is very integrated into the community. Um, and then right in the middle of town, this was a statue of a tea picker. Um, so I took this picture at, at night, and then this was just below where we stayed, and obviously um, pretty cool in terms of some of the music and uh, dancing from the indigenous communities. All right, so here's, uh, here's the final approach into the tea farm. And you can see, like I said, they're, they're working heavily on the road. And then we finally arrive at the path of our tea estate. Um, so this is the road going up to the little village. There's another village down below us here. Obviously, this is one of the gardens right here. Um, this is Ude, who is a Limbu man, and he is the owner um, of Pathavara. Um, there are a few other owners. Um, he's, I think, one of... They're all brothers, yeah, so it's all within the family. Uh, and then that's Tika. So this is what you're looking at, and I just say that, you know, down to the bottom of that valley is probably about 1,500 meters. So again, we climbed heavily to get up here. Um, the building with the blue roof is the factory, and then where we stayed is up here, um, in this, in this building right here. So Ude is on the left there, and then Nikos um, is the tea master, and this is him right here, and he's not very old, he's in his early 20s, but his dad was a tea master. And so he followed in his dad's footsteps and ended up getting a job working um, at Pathabara. Uh, by the way, Pathabara is the name of a Hindu goddess. And there's a very, very large uh, temple um, in her name that's just north of here in Teplujong. Um, so many Indians and Nepalis will do the pilgrimage 
up to that temple. Um, so that's where the name Path of Art comes from. The gardens range from 1,800 to 2,400 meters, so a little under 6,000 feet, up to almost 8,000 feet. As far as we know, again, we're not complete experts on the elevation of T, but we do know that it's some of the highest in the world. And what makes the quality of tea at that elevation different or unique is you get a lot of uh, hardening with the leaves and there's a lot of uh, climatic factors, you know, in terms of um, altering some of the chemistry. Um, so that's why we say the best tea grows at elevation. Now, um, Kachinchunga is to the north of the tea estate. It is the third largest peak in the world, and it is just massive in terms of a mountain. Um, it just spans a lot of kilometers. You can see it from the farm when, the, when it's cloud-free. It's when not very it's... common that you can see that view. And from our other farm that we work with in India, on a clear day, you can see it from there, too. So we're literally, there's this massive mountain. We're working over here, and we're working over here with these people. Yep, yeah. The only bummer was that they closed the border between Nepal and India, so we could not cross, and that's why we had to go back to Kathmandu and, you know, made the logistics significantly harder. Um, but um, we also got to spend a lot of time in Kathmandu, which was nice. Uh, and this is a picture that, of, uh, of it from the plane. Um, so you can see that it's sticking out way above the clouds. Okay, um, what does sustainability mean to our company? Um, and why we went to work with the Red Panda Network and with Pathavara. Desire to work directly with smaller artisan farms who are focused on producing quality teas in an environmental and socially responsible manner. Um, Developing meaningful relationships with tea farms and tea farmers. Um, we've done that with our Indonesian source. We've done it with our Chinese sources, our Taiwanese sources. Um, we've done it with our Kenyan sources, our Colombian sources. And now we're doing it with our Nepali source. Um, the last thing down here, the best tea comes from producers who know how to respect the ecology and take care of their employees. Um, and obviously, um, sustaining the community, right? And so there's a lot of different definitions of sustainability. Um, for me, it's gotta be more local. You know, it's gotta be down, distilled down to the most local level. Uh, so here's some, uh, this is uh, the factory, um, and you saw a picture of the roof, but this is inside of it. And this is Nico's processing some of the ruby red um, that we have outside. And then these are some of those tea pickers and TikTokers. And so these are the type of jobs, though, that allow them to stay in these villages and not go to Kathmandu or overseas. I can't tell you... Or, or poach. Or become a poacher right. or you know, a resource exploiter, if you will. And that's why, that's why RPN is working with these farms, because it, they know that it keeps people here and not looking elsewhere and interfering with the ecology of the Red Panda. Just there's so many Nepalis whose kids go overseas, they learn a language, and in fact, when we were in Elam, there was a Korean language school, so there was a ton of Nepalis there taking Korean so they could go work in Korea. So that happens all the time, and then of course they're sending the money back. You know, they send a lot of the money back. So this allows them to stay in their communities. And this is a picture of the second day of our visit while we were there. The sun came out, thankfully. Uh, but a pretty good shot looking across the gardens. The highest garden is on that ridge above you, and that's the garden that's at the 2,400 meters. Yeah, so Uday, Wang Chu, and Tika. Uh, this is a good shot of the Limbu village. Uh, so Uday's Limbu, Limbu is an indigenous tribe um, that was, you know, from this area. Um, you know, in Nepal, you're either related, like kind of Indo-Aryan, or you're 
uh, Tibetan and uh, Burmese, uh, but there's a lot of indigenous uh, groups um, in Nepal, and the Limbu are one of them. Um, this is, was this Uday's house here, I think? I think that's Uday's house, um, and then obviously this was a school, this picture was taken on Sunday, so, you know, the weekends don't mean anything there, um, so the kids are going to school. Some tea sorters in the factory, and this, of course, is all done by hand. Now, this was the coolest part of the whole um, trip for us. Went to at Sonam and Ang's um, instruction had brought 10 backpacks. And these backpacks were given to these 10 kids. And so this is a good example of how you reach kids at a young age um, and teach them about conservation. Um, you can see um, they're looking a little bit serious here, but um, <laughs> this was really cool. And, and so this is part of their approach when they go into community. Certainly, they're doing environmental education you know, and talking to them about pandas and their, their ecological needs. But they're also focused on what kind of sustainable livelihoods can keep them around and keep them working on behalf of red pandas. Um, so this was a little ceremony that we did on the second day. And um, you know the kids were kind of all around us during that day. So it was really nice to hang out with them. And so they've got a Red Panda Network logo. And then, of course, we slapped the Lake Missoula sticker on there. <laughs> and this is Wang Chu handing one out. And then I love this shot. Thank you, Raya. So sustainable development is possible when local communities drive the process. And we do believe that is what is happening here. Organic art artisan tea provides steady work and good wages for the villagers, and obviously is going to help the pandas over the long term. Um, right now, the estimate in Nepal is about 1,000 pandas in the wild. Uh, India has larger populations, and in fact, there's a couple of big national parks right on the border where there's pretty healthy populations of red pandas. Uh, there's also a lot of red pandas in China, um, not to be confused with giant pandas. You know. Okay, so tasting tea at the hut. We hung out at the hut when it was nice, um, so here we're laying it out, and this is all on a beautiful piece of stone that they've made a table out of. Um, but you can see Heather's up there sniffing, and we're all just kind of checking out. We get three teas from them. Obviously, they have many different varieties of white, green, and black tea. So uh, we also drank tea flowers and marijuana tea. <laughs> tea is infinitely more diverse than coffee, um, and that is reflected in the color. Um, reflected in the taste, and reflected in the smell. So that's why we love tea. And a nice shot of some of the fresh shoots. Yeah, so this is a good kind of uh, side view of the hut. Um, and as I said, the factory was right next to this, um, so it was easy for Nikos to go get the tea and bring it over here. And um, So that's why we were doing a lot of the tasting here. Um, this is a good shot of Nikos withering and drying freshly put leaves that the pickers had brought in. And then here he's kind of doing the final uh, inspection on this uh, batch uh, of ruby red. Yep, and here again is the final, the final product. Yep, so I said the sorters are doing this by hand again, to remove a lot of the stalks and stems, um, just to kind of clean up so it's the, the leaf and the bud is there. And yeah, this is a shot on the left of a tea, um, about a tea bud about to flower, 
and then the actual tea flower itself. We were there after the monsoons, so there were lots of uh, there were lots of uh, bugs. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of life. It was very green, um, and it felt like you know the jungle that we that we were expecting it to be. Um, this is a traditional Limbu house close to the tea factory, and uh, we kind of wandered down here after um, exploring the gardens. And um, this is a shot of one of the, the little beehives, um, homemade beehives that they constructed. But you'll notice that there is a dish up on that house. So yes, technology does rain. Um, so red panda habitat, absolutely adjacent to the tea farm. So as you look up this, um, you know, this is really, really thick and um, would not be easy to get around it. You know, it would be a really um, hard slog uh, because obviously there's water coming through all this, you know, all kinds of little rivulets and, and draws and ravines. And, uh, but this is why it's important that we're working here is that there are pandas all throughout this area. Yeah, this is a good shot, um, kind of looking from the back of the tea garden. And this is, uh, again, some of the, the fresh leaves, newly, you know, newly, newly grown leaves. Um, this was uh, a good picture of uh, the three of us with Wang Chu and Uday. And um, I, I will say that um, Wang Chu was our interpreter. He spoke really good English. Um, Uday's English was okay. Um, you know, could have some conversations, um, particularly after a few of the Carlsbergs and a little of the millet wine. Um, but yeah, we, we actually were able to communicate um, Nikos also could speak some English, not a lot, um, but Wang Chu was there all the time when we actually needed someone to translate. And our Nepalese was terrible. <laughs> our Nepalese was non-existent. Yep, another shot of the hut. Um, so, so yeah, some of the highest tea growing in the world. Um, I think that more than anything, what's important for people to take away is that when you invest in a relationship with people, you usually get a good return back. And so that's been our, you know, kind of our a philosophy and approach. And I know that um, we will go back to Nepal for sure. And it's, it's just not just the tea, it's the, the whole place, the, 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 the mystique around it. But we also know that um, this is some of the best tea that Lake Missoula Tea Company has to offer. And like Uday has these amazing connections in France um, where he works with a company called Palades. And this, they've got like, I don't know, 30 or 40 tea shops in France. And it's all high-end loose leaf tea. So they've got already some good accounts, uh, but I know they're excited to work with us um, because Again, the U.S. tea market continues to grow, and more and more people are drinking loose leaf tea. Um, so for all those reasons... I'm going to say that um, I just order tea. I order it through the Red Panda Network, and Sonia works with Uday, or Uday's family, to get the tea. And we just got a larger account, so I said, hold off. I think I'm probably going to double this. I'm going to order more, and I was able to double more from them. So now they know the next time I order, I'm going to order that much and more. So you're just kind of growing sustainably. And this is just kind of the pattern of how we work with farms. It just kind of grows and grows and grows. And it's it's not like leaking ahead. It's not too much ahead. We're going to set them up. But it's, it's just a really steady growth. And he know, I mean, they know that we want their tea. And um, it, it feels really good to be able to do that. For sure. Yeah. And we are getting some Limbo Green, which is coming from that really high farm that Jake mentioned. So that's coming yeah, in. Yeah, the Limbo Green. I really liked it. Yeah. Um, so this is the uh, the quarters, and I think uh, where were we? we? We were up on the, this level here. I think we were up on the second level. But the shot on the right is you know from our window looking out. Um, so we woke up to that every morning. Hello. 
but I just lost the mic. Um, but yeah, super great views um, from our accommodation. And um, right as we were, well not right as we were leaving, but Uday's goal with this is this part is going to become a cafe. And so something that we learned when we were in Indonesia is we went there, uh, that was our first tea trip uh, overseas in 2014. When we came back in 2018, they had created this little tea house um, at the farm in Indonesia because it was so close to these two national parks. This is similar. What they want to try and do is use this as a way of attracting some tourists. There's plenty of ecotourism around it, um, but they need a place for people to come eat and, uh, and then some quarters for them to stay in. Yeah, and this was the, you know, the food was all cooked um, on, the, on the wood fire. Um, you know, like, I lost weight there, man. I mean, it's like, you know. <laughs> we, also, ate, we ate moss. <laughs> right, what else? You guys remember, we ate moss that had been cooked. We ate fern. And fern. Some, and millet and something. But we literally, it's like, oh my goodness. It's, and one other thing that was just sort of blew my mind away. but it Lichens? Well, Lichen. Lichen. Yeah, the lichen. And they but, cooked it, and so this this little hut is right next. It's a little cooking hut, and I think that the the gal that was cooking was his cousin or something like that. And she said she actually preferred cooking in here as opposed to cooking on the electric stove or gas stove that they had in the in the um, kitchen. You know, and they grew. You know, all their vegetables were were growing around there, and like, you know, so all the food all the food was local. Um, this is the millet wine. Um, so it's in kind of like an aluminum, like little uh, pot, and then the straw, um, but it's fermented millet, um, and it was actually pretty good. Um, Heather didn't really like it very much, but I was sick. Oh, yeah, that's right. You were sick from she had a little stomach bug. Um, so this is cardamom. These plants with the long leaves here. That's cardamom growing right outside the tea farm. And so obviously they have a lot of cardamom. Um, and then this is a picture of some of the pots um, with the seeds inside of it. So ultimately, the Red Panda needs your help. Um, I want to encourage you, aside from buying some Panda tea, um, would be get involved with the Red Panda Network. They have an office in the U.S. in Eugene, Oregon, so they actually do have something going on here in the U.S. Uh, but certainly they are looking for whatever support, whatever advocacy you can provide them. Um, right now the estimate is somewhere 10 to 15,000 wild pa uh, red pandas in the wild right now. Um, so they are on the IUCN red list. So this is, you know, their endangered list. Um, so they need our help for sure, and we're hoping that the tea farm and you know the villages around it um, will recognize um, that. Um, and obviously, the Limbu and other indigenous people. Um, this is a photo of a guy. The last day I was there, I took a walk in the morning, and I'm out on the road, and I ran into this guy with his bow. I didn't see the arrows, he just had the bubble. Um, and then this was his wife, and they invited me into their house and made me some tea, um, which was really cool. Um, but they just lived, you know, they're, you know, people just live around the farm, and they're just, you know, they're locals. Now this, this was the very last day that we were there, and you could just see Cat Chunga sticking up there. Yeah, that's just the whites of that. Um, and I don't know, I mean, that's probably 30 miles away or something like that. It's, it's, it's a fair distance. How high is that ridge right there? This ridge right here would probably be, you know, at that 24, you know, 2400, 2500 meter uh, range. You know, that ridge was about equal to the one, you know, on the other side where the farm is. So, yeah, this is the... Uh, just kind of the final slide, and just you know, three cheers for Pathabara, Limboos, and then of course the Red Panda Network. And um, yeah, it was a good experience for us.
Anything else? I was just going to say the guy on the left was kind of a, he was a bit of a rebel. Yeah. He was, he was, he, he works with, he works with Nico, so he's kind he's of, like Nico's his, side hand guy. yeah, he's his side hand, um, side But he was saying, he was getting kind of, uh, like saying, you don't even speak Nepalese, or wasn't he, was it about our language, Uriah, do you remember? Maybe, yeah. There was something where he was, he, he saw, he, he questioned things, you know what I mean? He was just a little bit of a contrarian a little bit, which yeah. was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That he was, and he felt comfortable enough after a couple of days to like express it. Yeah. <laughs> like, you guys are here and you don't even speak Nepalese. You know, like, no, no, we don't. We're pretty weak that way. <laughs> but I mean, he had a he had a wife and oh, yeah, his yeah. kids. Oh yeah, completely uh, integrated into the. Yeah, he farm. was he's part yeah. of the farm and yeah, um, yeah and, and I can I can say this with the utmost honesty, not one bad experience in Nepal. I mean, in, in terms of like somebody like just acting really weird or aggressively or, you know, just really soft-spoken, really, really kind. And, um, you know, obviously that's part and parcel, I think, with their their philosophy and, you know, some of the, the Buddhist teachings. Um, but we felt really, really welcome there. Um, and we did in India, too. I shouldn't say that India was bad, uh, but India is much larger. So, you know, when you go to Nepal, I think you can have that more intimate type of experience um, because it is smaller, um, it is more rural, um, definitely more remote. Um, now you're going to run into trekkers and you're going to run into you know some of um, our ilk who are over there, you know, trying to you know climb something or or you know hike up to the Everest Base Camp. Um, so we ran into a few people that were doing that. Um, yeah, at the airport, but once we started on this, we were the only white people, almost exclusively, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, questions or um, comments from anyone? Yeah. So, I had to just ask, is there red panda? <laughs> Sorry. I no, no. The so red panda. Here. So the red is panda it is its right? own. Okay. It's its own genus. Okay. And the family that it's in is more closely related to raccoons, okay. skunks, and weasels. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so again, it makes it very much unique from the giant panda. I think that you can say that it's the most iconic species in Nepal, most widely recognized, and, and obviously enjoys the most public support. Does the red panda move into the tea fields as well, or does it stay mostly in tea? I don't think so. I think that it's pretty savvy when it comes to, like, disturbance. Um, and they're pretty secretive. Obviously, they're arboreal, um, so they're climbers. Um, I, you know, don't have enough, like, firsthand research knowledge about it, but, you know, according to Sonam, they're hard to find, you know, and so... You might be out there for a few years before you actually see one. Um, but I think that with their training programs, uh, you find more and more of these kind of citizen monitors, forest, you know, kind of forest ranger monitors, um, who are out there at least finding that they were there. You know, they may not actually see one, but they'll find scat um, or they'll find uh, tracks. Do they have to clear uh, native habitat to have tea farms? Originally, yes, for sure. So all that would have been cleared. Now, it could have been rice before it became tea. Pathavara started in the mid-80s. So it's been, a, it's been around for, you know, almost 40 years now. Um, so it's well established. But certainly we know in India that they are cutting down native forest to establish tea plantations. That is still happening. In Nepal, I think that that is less common, but certainly they are degrading forests in some ways. Um, I, I would think that um, new tea farm operation, if they were going into native forests, that would not be something that we would support. Obviously, RPN wouldn't support that because you know that would be kind of an affront to their conservation mission and and goals. Um, but there's no doubt that, like I said, the whole thing with the, road, the newer road coming in, um, that's going to bring in more people, and so it's going to affect maybe some of that tranquility or, you know, some of that, some of that space that the pandas enjoy. Um, I, I mean, ultimately, because they need the forest, that's, 
it, it's, a, it's a forest restoration and a forest conservation message. When we were at the farm, they said for us to go see a red panda, we would have to walk like four hours. And he said there, they, you can find them up in that ridge, but you're going to have to walk up there. And it was... It did not look like an easy thing to do. No. no. It's like, okay, well, let's just we put it this you, way. But, uh, we walked around the farm, and that was pretty steep in itself, yeah. and got back to the hut, and I had a bunch of leeches on my feet. Oh. So that was real nice. Were they doing active uh, logging in, in the area around your farms at all? Not anything large scale. Uh -huh. um, like, I can remember when the first day we were there, could hear a chainsaw down below, uh -huh. so they were cutting one tree down or something. Um, they use it for building materials, for sure, um, but we didn't see any mills, you know, any even any small mills. Okay. Um, but I'm sure there are some in you know some of the larger communities like Fitham and Elam. Both of those would probably had some. Some smaller mills or chainsaw. So you weren't frames. seeing like clear cuts and so forth. No, not at all. No. Okay, that's not all the no. There's no real logging industry like that in Nepal. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. Does not exist. Can you talk a little bit about traceability? Because you know obviously greenwashing is a thing, and as a consumer, how do we be sure of that? Look, here's the deal. We're done with these third party certifiers. Okay? Mm -hmm. we're, we're just it's not our model. Mm -hmm. So whether you're talking about Rainforest Alliance or fair trade or whatever, we want the direct stuff, okay? And we find that that's the most effective. And I think this is what Tim is on to now in terms of local business, I mean, uh, business to business, business, to business um, supporting one another. Um, and the logo thing in terms of creating that Red Panda brand can help start that. But, um, you know, we, we just haven't felt like it's very effective. And for the consumer, I think the consumer wants to know that their dollars actually went into that community or went into that sustainable business. Um, and I also think that we, these are kinds of things that you end up spending a lot of money on, you know, to get certified, and then how much of it actually comes back. Um, so. This has been our experience. It's by no means, um, you know, everything, but um, you know, we've had a little experience with the elephant friendly, um, and we just decided that we would rather work farm to business, you know, or business to business. Farm to farm to us. Farm to us. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Because yeah. the bigger the bigger plantations and bigger places, they do invest in the logo and they do invest in those labels, and it doesn't really. It doesn't mean that people are getting, I don't know, it just didn't feel, it doesn't, you look at who's getting it, you can get it, these guys could get it, you know, but it's money, and it, and it doesn't always mean that much. Here's a, here's a, let me just finish with saying that, and I'll, and I'll get your question. In India, so our farm, Nuxabari, Sonia has been in the process of trying to go organic um, since 2017 and has just run into a brick wall in terms of the Indian government and the bureaucracy um, that's involved in becoming organic. Well, so, she is organic. She's been certified. Something happened, and at the state level, they got rid of the, or, the body that, that, that uh, regulates whether or not you're organic. And so it's for a year or two, they're not even able to get registered as organic with the USDA because of this political weirdness in their local area. So. Um, but it's, so it's yeah, that's the, the some of the bureaucracy yeah. maybe, but also the fact that if you can cut through that and you can go, like I said, company to company, um, ultimately for the consumer, I think that's more satisfying and, and more productive. Yeah. Um, is there an automated mechanical way to pick tea, or if not, what necessitates the hand picking? This is all hand picked, but yes, there are machines that pick tea. Um, Japan, it's quite common. Um, so in some of the more developed countries, plantations, you, and, and then on some of the larger plantations, you will see that. Uh, but here in Nepal, no, These, this is all hand-picked. Um, so we didn't see any, uh, any tea-picking machines. Now, Claudia. Uh, yes, I don't know anything about the ecology of tea. Uh, is it a native that's, or varieties of it? Are they native to the area? Camellia sinensis, so this is the Latin name for tea, and there are a few subspecies of it, but it is a native 
plant slash small tree uh, that grows in the understory of the rainforest. So that was the second part of my question. Yep. Now, the farms, they're, pretty, they're cleared to some extent. It looks like they're varying size fields. But they grow in the understory of the rainforest, so is it? It did. It did. But it, is it in possible? terms of it's in, in its very natural state. Right. But is it possible to integrate the agriculture with the native um, process? Well, I mean, I think that, yes, there were trees around on, you know, so there are shade trees, and some farms have more than others. Um, because this is so steep, um, I was surprised that there weren't more terraces that they'd constructed. Um, and like in Indonesia, where we were there, there were lots of terraces that they had done. Um, but here, there was a couple little paths that you could take, but they were basically, they planted the tea right on the side of the mountain. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of the tea can coexist, you know, in that sense with the larger forest. Um, and I think that it's, um, it's a small, um, you, maybe what you might want to say is more um, permaculture, permaculture, if you will. Yes. Yeah, I, I would say it's more along that kind of mode. And we would see that in Yunnan. Like in China, we get tea from a place that is doing more, they've been doing it for a very, very long time. The people that have been there, if you've read The Girl from Hummingbird Lane, it's from that area. And they do, co the, the trees, the tea trees are, they're tea trees, they're not, they're not bushes like these are. They, they create a table so people can pick this. But those guys, the dye people, have been picking those leaves from those trees for 800 years for or a while. And so it does, there, are, there is higher canopy and lower canopy. Um, but that's not, so tea came from that, it sort of emanated out from that region of China. And kind of in through a psalm, and then it, you know it just kind of traveled that way. But not very common it's to not see super common. Yeah. tea trees growing in a forest reserve. Right. So now it's like a forest reserve. But yeah. what I, I'm just looking at ways uh, to address Patty's question. Do you have to clear? Well, maybe it's not necessary to clear. No, you don't have to clear everything. No, no, you don't have to. You definitely don't have to clear cut it. And again, there was all kinds of other vegetation growing, um, flowers. And Butterflies. some farms will leave like certain trees because the the uh, environment around it will affect the flavor of the tea. So they like to keep things like I mean you're gonna it has to clear at some level so that you can get some production and yield. But um, it does they do like having some of these places that are really keen on being it keeping to the environment and stuff. They know that it makes a really good flavor. And, and obviously path of error. There's no chemicals. There's no pesticides. It's it's completely organic. You know they're not applying. You know, anything. Anything on it. Yeah. Beverly. How many folks work at Pantavera? We thought that there was probably about 20, 25 maybe? 25 what? How many people work at Pantavera? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Because there's different stages of involvement. Yes. And so at times of the year, there might be more pickers. Yeah. At other times of the year, there might be more people working in the processing, you know, in the factory and the sorting. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's drivers you know, now in terms of the transport. Um, but it's not a large company. You know, I wouldn't call it like, you know, it's, it's not, I mean, Sonia's farm in Nuxabari, she's got 1,200 people that work for mm -hmm. her. So it's completely different. It's a much larger estate. So what's the harvest season? Three pickings? Uh, you know, I think, that, sure. I think there's three flushes or three picks. Um, they were just doing a pick while we were there. Um, they don't really pick during the monsoon season. And you were just there when? Uh, the monsoon season starts in June and goes till like the end of August, early September. We were there in October, so we were there kind of just after the monsoon season. But again, super green. You know, it was like everything was alive. Like I said, lots of bugs and kind of the you know the the, the micro the microfauna. Um, what's the the market for the poached pandas? Do you know who, who buy them for what? I would imagine it's going to China. You know, so much of the wildlife traffic ends up in some of these Chinese markets. Um, they have to get it out, you know, without being detected, um, which basically means probably taking it over the range, over the mountains to get there, you know, through Tibet or something. Um, 
because there is a lot of enforcement now. You know, there's a lot more, um, yeah, there's a lot more wildlife monitoring going on um, in the airports, you know, and so I think that's probably what's happening now. Maybe 20 years, 20, 30 years ago, that was much more common from what RPN was telling us. It's gone down through some of their education and outreach efforts, but um, it still is happening. Um, and I don't know what a pelt would fetch, you know, in terms of the value, uh, but clearly it's absolutely gorgeous fur. You know, it's got this red and then kind of black fringes and yeah, it's, it's really, really, I'm sure it's valuable to somebody, you know, that is into that. But, yeah. So when you were talking about your model of sustainability from farm to business with your teas in Nepal, is that also a model that you're bringing to the rest of your sources for teas, like in China and Kenya and those sorts? Yeah, definitely. The social, making sure that it's at that kind of social element, which is the community level. And all of these tea farms that we work with are operating uh, at a more rural level. A community uh, level. Or a community level. And so these are smaller villages um, that are surrounding the tea farms. Um, I think that from there, you know, into the economic um, part, it's more about making sure that those jobs, you know, are consistent and they have obviously a market for the tea, um, which is more where we come in. Uh, but I know that all the farms that we have visited definitely would, uh, you know, other than, you know, Sonia's is the largest, uh, it's an estate, um, and Pathabar is called an estate, but it's really a farm. Uh, but the only farm that we work with that, again, is a larger scale operation is the Nuxalbari. But even there, it's all the workers live right around the tea farm. And the, it's like a community. So it still goes direct to, to community. Yes, for sure. And it's outside of the larger community of Bagdagra where we flew into. So it really is its own little village. You know, look uh, bigger than these villages um, in terms of their numbers. Um, but again, there's like 1.5 billion people living in India now. You know, so Amazing. it's crazy how many people live in India. In the rural areas, not as many, but still a lot more people than in Nepal. Uh, yeah? Do you, um, when you're making choices about the farms that you're going to work with, do you factor things in like like child labor and children going to school and, you know, those so kinds of social? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know when you're at these farms, they actually are the source for kids going to school. Like, they're paying for the education, and the education is often happening right there. Otherwise, it wouldn't even be available half the time. So at the, we're operating with people that are, it's at a village level, like he's talking about. Um, we've never seen kids working. I've never, it doesn't seem to ever be an issue um, from what we've seen and experienced in the people. We know these people. Like, we communicate with them a lot. And, I don't see evidence of that. I mean, this is, this is a it. good example. Our first tea trip to Indonesia, we stumbled down from the farm into this little village, same thing. Couple invited us in, and we got, you know, kind of um, chatting, and come to find out that their son is driving his little scooter some, like, maybe 80 kilometers to Bandun to go to school. But again, the only reason he can do that is the income that's coming from the farm, right. you know, that his parents are working at. Uh, so uh, they also like the Indonesian um, farm in instituted a dental program mm -hmm. and also for eyeglasses. So real basic stuff yeah, yeah, that you need. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool for us to find out. Um, you know, here in Nepal, um, we didn't get so much into the healthcare side of it, um, but it's a long way to a doctor. You know, this is, I suspect the farm supports a lot of the social aspects right. of this village. Yes, you know, like yeah. if someone was sick, and that they would help facilitate finding a doctor or getting a doctor there. Yeah, um, yeah it's it, it's never a perfect science, um, but you look at enough of the characteristics um, of the farm, 
And as I said, I think the key word is artisan, um, that the way they're doing the tea is different than a large, right. you know, commercial um, tea operation right. um, where you would be maybe using machinery and obviously a lot more people to process the tea. Um, so scale has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, until you go there, yeah. you don't really know. No. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Can you use the word eco-tourism when you're talking about constructing a new tea house? How would you differentiate that from normal tourism? Because I think usually people think good for economy, not so good for there aren't very many tourists that would like drive up this road and go and do this. Um, an eco-tourist that might be looking for a hike or a trek would. Um, you know, there is also um, a lot of kind of wildlife observation and people who want to go, um, you know, see nature. Um, so there's that element to it. Um, you know, in Nepal, um, I think a lot of the uh, um, people's imaginations get kind of, you know, captured by the trekkers and people who are going to try and, you know, get up into the, you know, the heart of the Himalayan range. But um, there are plenty of opportunities, I think, for people to stay at kind of smaller lodges or little guest houses. And ultimately, that's what this is going to be is, you know, kind of a smaller lodge um, that people could come. And again, it would be like a couple or, you know, a small group. I know that um, right after we were visiting, there was a delegation coming from Paladay, the French company, and I think there was eight of them coming. Um, and they come every year. Um, so again, this is part of his vision is that he wants to actually try and attract people from overseas um, to come and visit. Um, so that's like still very much in its infancy. Um, but I think it will happen. I, I really do because um, just like we were ca captivated by um, the scenery and the terrain and all of it, um, we found it was just like I said, took a lot longer to get there than what we would expect in our own country. Or, um, and so you have to have a lot of patience and you have to have a little bit of support. Um, uh, certainly wouldn't recommend doing your own driving there. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it wasn't scary, but it was, like I said, you, you, want, you want the locals to do that. Jake, um, in terms of this country and businesses like yours, the tea trade, are you aware of many of them that kind of are consistent with your model of uh, sustainability and direct contact with the suppliers and checking out the model. I'm just really curious. Just to come, hop, hop, hop. I think there are some, you know, I think that there are some companies that have that, you know, kind of um, that dedication, you know, and, and that, uh, you know, that philosophical bent, but not many. Um, you know, there's a lot of large tea companies out there that are buying the cheapest tea they can get, okay? And that's part of, you know, our economic model, you know, buy cheap, sell high, right? Um, so that's why for us, we're selling loose leaf tea. It's of higher quality, it's fresher, and it's definitely better for you than a lot of that bag tea that's been sitting in that box for two years. JJ, what I would say, yeah. um is that we work with a lot, many farms, where you might find another company or something. I know of a company where this guy works with far, uh, farms in India, you know, and that's kind of his focus, and he's actually Indian, and he's, you know. But I don't know of a lot that are working with so many farms so directly and importing so directly and are looking at it from this angle. I'm sure there are, but... Um, definitely coffee. You could definitely yeah. make the leap over to the coffee realm. There are. I mean, there are there, other tea So there's more examples, this, I think, but, with the coffee trade. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Friends? I have a question regarding uh, what kind of tea do the locals drink there? Because when you come from here, you know that the best coffee is yep. getting to the US and everywhere else. Okay. So what kind of tea do they I, I'll say that I see two models in addressing your question. Is that if, you, if the tea comes from um, the culture that it's growing in, like in China, it comes from that culture. Um, 
uh, in Taiwan, it comes from that culture, then the people are drinking really good quality and they're drinking, they look at it differently. If it's in a, been imposed from a colonial system, they're often not drinking it at all. And they're drinking like instant, or they're just drinking really poor product. So they're picking really quality, but they're going home and they're serving something out of a little bag. So you, you did see that. In this same. case, they're drinking it. In this case, it's part yeah, of their drinking. culture. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if right. you go to Kenya, they're not drinking the tea that they're picking. Um, where else? If you go to Indonesia, they're not drinking the tea that they're picking. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the 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 man and the woman, the guy with the bow that I ran into when I went to their house. They had tea. They had tea, uh -huh. but of course then they put sugar. <laughs> you know, so it's like, okay, I mean, I'm not going to drink it. That's fine. But we normally wouldn't do that. Yeah, right. yeah. So again, it's somewhat personal taste, but it's a good question, and I will say that. I mean, Uday had this amazing um, taste in his mouth, like like his his flavor profile wheel just it just kept very turning, different, yeah. very different. And but like I said, they have really, I think, pioneered a lot of these really really imp impressive blends. Um, and so the white teas were unusual for us, the, the, both the number of them and the different flavors that they were able to generate from the white teas. You know, usually white tea, it's the least processed of all teas. It's just dried and withered. So it's really kind of subtle, you know, in terms of its flavors. But some of these just jumped out at you. Um, the Limbu Green that we're going to be getting, really, really interesting green. Um, so I think it varies, but I do know that, like, when we were in Kathmandu, I was doing an interview with Sonam for the Trail Less Traveled for Mandela's show. And these guys walked over to a tea house. Um, that woman? The Chinese woman and a Nepalese man. They were married and they had. But it was hard to find like a tea house like It was kind of hard to find that. You know, yeah. a lot of boba tea. Uh -huh. yeah, there was plenty of boba around. Sure. She <laughs> loved boba. Listen, everybody, thank you very much for coming. Um, it was really Becca, yeah, Becca's going to like do a really quick little. Uh, Dun -dun -dun. Dun -dun -dun. So there'll be some uh, some raffle winners here. Is this for the cup, the earrings, or the t-shirt? Yeah, I'm like, which one? You, you pick it. You pick it. You pick it. All right, we'll go with the cup I first. The cup first. Okay. Martha Silverman. <laughs> Martha gets the cup. Martha gets the cup. Nice. Martha Silverman. All right, and uh, how about you want to do? All right, for the T-shirt. Here's your. So if you go on the Red Panda Network site, they have a shop page, and you'll see maybe some of the rugs and you know some of the other trinkets they have. But they are also selling tea in this little thing here. And so you know I bought one just because I wanted to kind of check out there. But you can see they've got the USDA certified right there. Um, but anyway, so there's just some ruby red in here. So someone's going to get this. Yeah. 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 Yeah.